Every human being has weird thoughts going through their head. Oh God, it's so embarrassing. I'm afraid I'll never get another job again. That I will die and will have not been special. My brain has the gift of seeing the terrible. A million pound tourniquet being turned against my chest that was constant. Then I started sabotaging my own career. Wanting to die and... To stop him from feeling any joy. <laughs> that is... Very uncomfortable in my own body. I ended up becoming a male prostitute. And what I became was an animal. They took away my shoelaces. I became chaos. Like it hurts. I just want to go. I just want to leave. You have no idea what a small part of your life this is. If you go to a support group, it's like creating a family that you didn't have. I mean, life is one percent event. My body was abused. Ninety-nine percent judgment about that event. But they couldn't touch the best parts of me. But the world is a little bit wounding. It's also glorious. It does always get better. It really does. I'm here with uh, Maria Bamford, and I'm so happy to have you on the podcast. I've been I've been wanting to get you on for a while, and I know our, our, your your schedule is pretty crazy. So I really appreciate you uh, taking taking time out to. Oh, no. Thank you very much. Welcome, Mark. <laughs> Thank you so much. Because and I yeah because I I, uh, I and I, I desperately have something to promote, so I have to I have to I, 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 and so it's sad that. Yeah. That, Are that, you starting at the bottom then and working your way up to things that will actually promote it? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Where, where do you start when you start promoting? I've got it. Maybe that's it. But it's it's a it's attraction rather than promotion, isn't it? <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, I don't know where I got that, but um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a special, special, special coming out and Wednesday, twenty eighth. You can download it at chill dot com, and it's an hour long comedy special. F- for just my parents in the audience. You're just performing for two people, your parents. Two parents. Well, cut out the middleman. Why get all these 800 strangers together, and that's being generous, uh, into a theater <laughs> uh, when the only people I'm really trying to please, Marilyn, Joel Bamford. And, and Maria is not kidding. This is a this is a downloadable uh Yeah, no, it costs special. something. It's $4.99. And you are literally performing just for your your parents. I can't wait to uh, to see this. Yes, especially when I close with the suicide chunk, but I serve pizza right before uh, I really? go, start going into the suicide material. <laughs> oh my god, that's fantastic! I can't wait to see this. Um, so I'm sure it will already be up by the time this airs. By the time, yes, yeah, because yes. I, I'm so, yes. I, I record these sometimes weeks in advance. Um, I'm so sorry for promoting something right in the beginning. No, not at all. We'll we'll promote it again at the at the end, and I'll put it. Make sure to put a link up on on my website. Yeah, so that's that so much more people... appropriate. <laughs> Marie's already beating herself up. This is fantastic. <laughs> so you are uh, for those of you that have been living under a rock and don't know who Maria is. She is one of the, the mo- most original voices in stand up comedy uh, today. She uh, has been very open on stage about her uh, mental illness and makes light of it in a way that is so funny and so touching. It's like a lot of comics will skim the surface talking about their life and their pain and then occasionally dip down a little bit into it. But like Maria in the first 10 minutes of her act will just go right to the center of the earth and spend your time there and there's a bond that 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 your audience members feel for you that is can you feel that 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 depth well um i'm having a lot of feelings uh during the show but i i and i i usually i i don't go into my darkest material until or not dark but more intimate material until you know uh, i have to warm up and do some stuff about food some light material about gas station recipes and uh i wish they would provide them for have you ever had a gas station tuna fish sandwich oh my god it's so good because there's no tuna in it it's just a scrumptious fishy nougat um anyways but so i start with something and then then i'll yeah so no i mean i'm not i'm not uh that that was a very generous description of me uh kindly uh uh but i uh what i'm trying to say is I, I like talking about stuff like that, and I think um, now because of the internet, where you can get a specific, more specific audience, I think I get an audience that is more open to that, which is 
such a relief. It's so delightful. Yeah, I mean, when you think of stand-up comedy in the in the 90s, it was very often uh, the headliner and the audience the, the audience just showed up for the comedian. Yeah. And for a, a, an original voice like yours, I would imagine that had to have led to some painful nights because <laughs> there are people that don't get you, people that haven't experienced profound pain in the right. place that your your comedy comes from. <laughs> everybody's experienced some profound but or they don't want because I, I understand like I, I like to go see music no I don't wait a minute I've seen music <laughs> that's what I want to say I've seen music but I, I think you know I kind of like pop music and I uh, you know like I'm not so much like a folk music kind of like you know sad real songs of and I think I may be the music the comedy equivalent of something that i don't like uh right. in music you know right? not not don't like but just like if i wanted to go out oh i want to go see lady gaga you know it's something super fun and and <laughs> and some people but i i prefer to uh you know, so i understand that people would you know i'm going out on a friday night i don't want to hear about the eight thousand u.s veterans that die of suicide every year <laughs> Which is funny because you think they die over there, but they come home. <laughs> oh, I thought it must be funny because no one's taking it that seriously. <laughs> have you heard, have you said that on stage? Oh yes, yes. And just awkward silence. So, were, yes, yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, the, and yeah, that's sort of a shock value. My dad was in the military, and I, I just, I get so mad about it. I just get so mad. I've read. I mean, I, I don't know anything more than anybody else. I've just read magazine articles and listened to the New York Times and quote it as if it were the Bible. <laughs> um, it is not the Bible, nor is the Bible the New York Times. <laughs> uh, and if there is a science, and we don't know, uh, but uh, <laughs> we don't know if there's a science, but there is a God. Um, uh, but, but what did I say? What was I? I can't remember now. Uh, that, uh, about more soldiers dying uh, soldiers, from suicide oh, than yeah. are dying overseas. Yeah, that that why? What's going on? And and my own personal experience with you know suicide or uh, you know unbearable mental. Uh, mental problems you know whatever those are for anybody uh whether it is ptsd you know it is unbearable and the reason that people kill themselves is not out of you know like uh sassy pettiness or like that you know like that just kill it what, i'm like, not getting my way yeah yeah because right. people, people the one thing i always hear is like you know or one joke i've been making you know people get so mad at you if you do that they will get so mad at you if you commit suicide which is like why would you get you don't i mean you can get mad at anybody for for dying of an illness but it's like no the reason they die is they suffering just like un uh, you know, uh, unbelievable suffering, and and that, uh, but so much for society. I mean, even my, uh, myself. Like when I got to a point where, uh, you know, I was making plans to kill myself, I thought oh, it might be just a little bit less dramatic if I killed myself instead of going into a hospital. You know, like I would. <laughs> you know, really? Well, like you know what I'm saying? Because how long ago was this? Oh, uh, was but a. Uh, year and a half ago I, I went through uh i went into the hospital about three times i had some sort of uh fiscal cliff uh, i did it wasn't fiscal it was just a cliff and um <laughs> everything was fine was, it wasn't triggered by money no. no oh no no okay. no no. but uh no it was oh just, you're talking about what's going on with the with the country the, yeah yeah the fiscal yeah, yeah, cliff, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um uh, which uh sounds fun sometimes to think about it um <laughs> How, how tall is it? Um, uh, is the water warm? Um, so, yeah, I went, uh, I, I, you know, living in California, where it's super liberal, super kind of groovy, and I'm a comedian, I'm in entertainment, and I have a problem with, you know, going into a hospital for 72 hours just so I won't kill myself. You know, I can't imagine, like, what these 18-year-old dudes who are coming back who are from, you know, more conservative backgrounds, you know, they, yeah, they're, yeah there's counseling available, available or somebody to go, but I just, I can't imagine that there isn't some, you know, huge block to going in 
for for help because I felt uh, embarrassed, and I talk about this stuff all the time, and right. I had to, and, and I'd even heard stories of people. You know, I mean, there's so many people who have come out to talk about that. You know, Jonathan Winters and um, uh, the. Uh, I, Oh goodness! I'm so sorry. I'm going to forget everybody's name who has ever come out to talk about it. Um, um, William Styron. William Styron, the guy who who um, he does it was a talk show host in the in the seventies and sixties and seventies. Really, he interviewed John Lennon and Janis Joplin. Dick Cabot. Dick Cabot. Oh, I didn't know that. About oh, Dick yeah. Cabot. He's totally come out about going into the psych ward and. Really. <laughs> yeah, and. Um, but he's so handsome. <laughs> and cheerful and fun, and he was on TV. He has, so, he has so much to be happy about. <laughs> Not, is there anything more aggravating than that? That when people say, "But look at what you have to be grateful for," that you might as well just wear a sign that says, "I don't understand depression." <laughs> I don't understand. Well, because yeah, it's like I mean, well, William Styron's book, "Darkness Visible." I mean, that is it. Like just whoa, you know, just like it's um. It has nothing to do with anything, you know, it has nothing to do with, uh, it's like you forget anything in the past, like your brain just forgets anything in the past, like I could not believe that I was ever going to come back from it, and I just thought, I've, I've got to end it, and um, and also with our healthcare system, which, I mean, I have great insurance, but, you know, they kind of want to get you out of there, and um, which, I mean, it, it, like they... They kind of, tr- <laughs> they trusted me. Like they gave me, I was trying new medications and and all the mood st- stabilizer medications have different side effects. I mean, just like any other illness, you know, I'm sure anyone who's had any experience taking medication, it's like the side effects are sometimes worse than the right. actual. <laughs> it's like two steps forward, one step back. Yeah. And so I, I had a, I was taking something that started uh cognitively affecting me where I couldn't say things. Is this while you were in the hospital? No, this was uh, while I was trying to work. You know, I was like trying to get the meds, you know, to change my meds and then uh, still work. And that was uh, ridiculous. Wow. Yeah, because I mean, and I think nobody, that, that's another thing is that nobody will tell you to stop working. Like people go, right. well, you seem, I mean, you're competent, you know, like, well, of course I'm competent, but like you wouldn't say to somebody who just had a a kidney transplant, you wouldn't say, you, you know, maybe you should fly to Atlanta this weekend. You know, do maybe like eight shows. I mean, you can do it. I mean, this is stuff you can do. You know, because it's not. I guess, and and that's that's what happened. Is I didn't take the time off, and it really s- snowballed into this nightmare. You know of. Um, I was, I mean, I've told this story before. I was in Chicago and, uh, was supposed to do a bunch of shows and I, I just thought, okay, I've, I just got to go, even though I was feeling worse and worse, like, just like, like not able to think. I don't know if you have ever had that <laughs> experience, but it's terrifying. Not yet, yeah, not able to think or calm down or, um, you know, and I have, all the benefits at, at my disposal. You know, I exercise, I eat right, I have tons of friends and family and support, and I have a, you know, therapist and all that stuff. And, and you go um, to support groups? Yeah, support yep. groups. And, uh, yeah, I mean, meditation, you know, everything. And, um, I, 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 and you know, I was in Chicago. I've lost all of my identification like I was trying to get ready for the show and and I just somehow lost everything like I was walking the streets and I just lost everything somehow cut myself on something I started bleeding and I was like I was I uh, and it's like call my mom I'm like I just she's like honey get yourself to the airport go to Delta tell them you are gold medallion (laughs) and tell them about your website and so it came to pass, Paul Gilmartin, and uh, and I got an upgrade all the way home to Los Angeles, and I missed those those shows. But I think, I, which I felt just so ashamed ashamed about, and I, you know, had I had I just had some 
And there isn't a lot of heads up either when you're taking medication like I my because they don't know what the side effects are going to be so sometimes they don't tell you what they what they probably will be because they don't want you to think that you're going to have them or whatever anyways i it and each person insane. is a it's little totally bit different. different yeah it's totally different so but um and it did t- it was such a long process it was like a year until i mean i've only started feeling better you know more like myself like probably the past three or four months Wow, that's so, a long time. Yeah, it's a long time, and 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 that's, but that's that was, at least I, I go. I, I want to say that because I wanted it to be right away. Right. You know, I was just like, I'll get this taken care of, and um, everything's going to be great. And it's just you know, and and that's what everybody else wants too. Just like fix it, okay, back to work. You're right. doing great, and um, <clears throat> yeah, and I and I definitely wanted that too, and. Um, I'd just like to interject at, at, at this point. The two most important things, I think, when you're dealing with a, a mental illness tor- towards yourself, the two most important things are kindness and patience. Yeah, yeah. And it's the hardest thing because it, it, your brain is all confused and you're feeling terrible about yourself. And, you know, you just got to... I mean, I have some really good friends and... Um, who are very, yeah, loving and caring and said, oh, you know, come stay overnight with us or whatever. But at the same time, I mean, there's some point where I felt like I needed to be hospitalized because I didn't want to put them in the position of like, hey, could you just kind of watch me? Uh, Right. Because I don't know what I'm going (laughs) to (laughs) do. When was the first time you... And, and, and we'll come back to yeah, to, yeah, yes. to the hospitalization, but I want to kind of set the, the the table for where where this all started and how it it, it progressed. What was what was your uh, childhood like? It was uh, uh, upper upper middle class Duluth, Minnesota. Delightful. My father's a physician. Um, I think I just got the gift. I don't think there was anything terrible happening. I think it just for my my brain has the gift of seeing the terrible and but it wasn't spectacularly dysfunctional or anything and um but I I started having when I was 10 years old I started having suicidal ideation like starting to think of wanting to die and kind of writing in my journal of wanting to die like um and I got into like kind of obsessive prayer you know like praying to God please help me please help me please help me and and then I think I, um, I don't think we all know God doesn't exist. Anyways, <laughs> he does exist uh, for some. And um, <laughs> I don't, I don't. do you do you believe in God? Um, not not so much anymore. Now I I and partially because of that um, that mental crash because um, I felt no no comfort like nothing you know and just feeling like. Okay, you know, and feeling like uh, some of my spiritual friends were not super helpful in that area. We're like, you know, you just need to keep praying, you know, and God will. Co- and 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 I do think it is a function of the brain is our God consciousness, and mine was just broken and off. And and I do believe in h- human beings. I do. I, I know I don't understand why people are kind or loving, and you know, I don't. I, you know, I I know I'm not, uh, I'm not powerful at all. Um, but um, but I also I don't like that idea of saying oh, it, I did have some uh, friend of mine come visit me in the hospital who uh, was of that belief where um, she said oh you know this place just has really negative energy. God, you just, you really need to get out of here. That's what I said, but they 5150 would me. And I'm like, you know, and they're like, they took away my shoelaces. You know, you need to do, and I, I'll drive you. Let's go to Ojai, right? Like, jump off, right? Or like, go slowly into the cold water, or like, from a tree, right? You know, I just feel like this is the story you're telling yourself. I mean... If you, I talked to my spiritual advisor, he said, if you want to leave, if you want to go to the next level, you know, maybe you're done with this plane of existence and you want to move into the next world and, you know, I'm ready to let you go. Are you uh, serious? Yeah. 
And I was like, you're horrible. Uh, and please come visit me tomorrow. <laughs> and you're horrible. <laughs> and if you could bring me some sort of uh, bottled Diet Coke, because uh, they won't let us have cans. Uh, and it's the one thing I'm living for, despite uh, besides uh, crushed ice. <laughs> they have lots of crushed ice machines in the psych ward, uh, which is helpful. And, uh, hey, why don't you bring that little ray of sunshine over to the children's hospital? You wouldn't have to make a wish if you believed. <laughs> um, you know, where there's that element with religious or where it's like, it's somehow your fault that you've distanced yourself from this God through sin or through a uh, lack of awareness. And, and I just, I just feel like that's so cruel, you know, to, to, s- s- uh, say to people, I mean, it can be a great comfort, I think, if you believe it, but then at some point, <laughs> you know, uh, it's it's devastating when you can't f- feel it at all. Um, but I don't know. So, uh, so childhood uh, suicidal childhood. I- I ideation just, yeah, at, at so 10? I, and yeah, and so I developed sort of a, a, a eating disorder, I think, which kind of helped me uh, kind of numb out where I'd you know, uh, starve and then eat a bunch of food, you know, so I'd, I think it kind of helped me regulate my mood really, you know, where it's like I could, um, kind of be out of it all the time. Was it, was it like it gave you something to focus on other than the thought of killing yourself? yourself yeah. 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 It was kind of, cause I also started having a little OCD around the same time of, um, there's a type of OCD is called like unwanted thought syndrome, which People think I'm making up, but I have. It. There's some books about it called The Imp of the Mind, and um, uh, what's the other one? By the way, Maria, uh, people that take the survey on uh, our web, yes. the website, you cannot believe how many people have unwanted thought syndrome. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I love my dog more than anything in the world. Yeah. They'll write, and I think constantly about killing it. Yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to do that. Yeah, and unfortunately, these people take this anonymously so I can't email them back and say you have no under no idea how common that is that people have unwanted thoughts and the most common one is you're at the top of a of a building yeah and you just keep thinking I'm going to jump I'm going to jump I'm going to jump I'm yeah. going to jump but that it can present itself in many many other many, and, and horrendous things oh. like things like there's a the, another book is tormenting thoughts and secret rituals which is um and because it, it's it's about it, it happens as a part of postpartum depression too, where women will you'll think of molesting or um, or killing uh, your baby or something, and and how what what and it's also it's such a taboo thought because yeah, every human being has weird thoughts going through their heads. Like I mean, I don't know if you ever sometimes comedians you know will say things like that. Like here is the my dog looks sexy. Like right. you know whatever, <clears throat> but. It, for most people, it just fleetingly go through your mind, and you just like blink and go uh and move on. But if you have like that OCD trait, you start try, trying to want to get rid of the thought, which makes it come back. You know, so I started like gripping my fists, you know, trying to or and tried to started to avoid people, which that's what happens with OCD. You start avoiding the. Um, whatever it is, whatever the dirt or external thing is. But I started avoiding, um, uh, my thing was, (laughs) I was, uh, and I was, I was lightly molested, uh, as a child by, I I mean, it wasn't, you know, it was just a sort of like, uh, oh gracious, I won't go into detail, but anyways, it wasn't, it it wasn't a long-term thing and it was just, uh, but it, it was very big in my mind of what had happened and it was just some light touching around the breasts. Anyways. Um, well, you know, I, I say this all the time in the podcast, Maria, it's, it's not what happens physically as much as it is the mishandling of our soul and the feeling that we don't matter, that somebody is sending us a signal. You don't matter. You are my object. That that. is that. The injury. That's the powerful thing. And I think I was also a super, sensitive kid and but anyway so what my unwanted thoughts would be is that I would do that to another person so I stopped spending time with um friends like because I was worried that I would reach out and try to touch somebody um 
and then what? And then also, I started not being able to sleep at night because I was worried I was going to kill my entire family. And then I, <clears throat> I told my mom that. You know, I finally got up the courage to tell my mom that because I wasn't sleeping. And and uh, they sent me to therapy, where I went and talked to an ex nun, and she let me sleep on her couch, uh, which is basically all that happened. Which was therapeutic in itself uh, to get to sleep, uh, but it was also it was Christian therapy. So she gave me this terrifying book called Heinz Feet in High Places, which is this horrendous, like, er allegorical uh, book about a, it's like a dwarf going on a journey. Anyways, I found it so deeply disturbing, and I still do now. I went and got it to read it to see what it was like, and I'm like, what the fuck? Like, why would this be a comfort at all? And it was all about suffering, and that this little being suffers and suffers and suffers, and then through suffering meets God. Whoa. You know, I mean, I was like 12, you know, like, oh, it's just so awful. She couldn't give you, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Yeah, want to some more, uh, uh, a beat, uh, you know, Clifford, the big red dog. What about that guy? He's pretty, that's pretty comforting. <laughs> So, the, the the unwanted thoughts, um, you told your, your mom about that, and then this therapist knew about that. Right. And my mom thought I was gay because of those thoughts. She thought it was a gay thing that I was thinking of molesting, you know, because it was girlfriends. But it was like, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like I was attracted to somebody. And I have really thought through that uh, extensively. Uh, as Jackie's education says, uh, I've been to college. And, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, so it wasn't about that. You know, this is the same as, like, I, I didn't, you know, you don't want to molest your dog. You don't want to kill your dog. But it's like, as soon as, it's just like this dark thought that, and then you can't get it out because you want to fix it. And it, what does it mean about me as a person? And then I've got to make sure that I don't do it. So I've got to isolate myself from people. And I had that until I was about 35. And I finally decided to Google on the internet. I love the internet. And, you know, on, you know, disturbing thoughts. And up came all these OCD sites, and I ordered some books, and I got an OCD therapist, and did some flooding where you, I mean, they have it on that OCD show where it's like somebody sits in a dumpster, and the equivalent of that for me was like letting myself think all the horrible things I want and staying with people, like just sitting with a friend and just going, oh, I'm having all these horrible, creepy thoughts, and, and just letting it peak get as bad as possible and then and finding out nothing happened so uh so it was uh but yeah so it, it, you, it was a big you, deal are you comfortable sharing any of those thoughts Ugh, or is that they is that are not, intense they're just so I, ha I, I have them too yeah yeah i have them too and they don't stick with me as long as they stick with you but they shame me yeah they're shaming and that's yeah, yeah. and that's what i i the reason I ask you to share that some is I would be willing to share some too, if you want to go back and forth to to help the listener feel less fucked up. Well, I do have the joke that I do um, where uh, <laughs> which brings up where um, I talk to the therapist, OCD therapist. She says, um, "Have you ever thought of?" Uh, yeah, just all, they have to ask you questions of what your thought patterns are, and just, what was it, um, I've forgotten this joke now, but how, uh, have you ever not wanted to go to a religious institution because you worried you'd lose control, run up on the altar, take a shit, and yell, I'm a promise keeper? <laughs> have you ever not wanted to go to SeaWorld, because you were, if you're left alone with a baby starfish in a tide pool, you'd try to uh, take it out and kiss its poop hole? <laughs> Okay, um, have you ever not wanted to spend alone time with friends or family because you'd worry you'd ta chop them up into chunks and bits and then have sex with the chunks and bits and then put the chunks and bits on a Caesar salad and toss it and then feed it back to your parents or eat it yourself? Yeah, and I mean, really, because we have imaginations. Like, it yeah. just goes and goes and goes. And I mean, I mean, that's the tenure of what... 
I don't even know if that's the right word. That's the uh, thematic uh, of what what I would think about. And I yeah, mm-hmm. I just it does it, it would be pretty good if I could talk about it, but it just does gross me out so much that it yeah. It makes me feel bad. Okay, we we, we we won't go there then. But I just wanted. Um, but I just I, want to let know everybody know I've thought of everything. I feel I feel this I feel the same way. You know, slicing uh, nice people's heads off, fucking fucking babies, yeah. killing puppies. Uh, uh, you know, um, you name it. You name it. I have I have th- things that I. Where the fuck did that? Did yeah. that did that come from? from? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, there's a, and and I think you know there is a difference between that almost everybody has weird thoughts that come into their head, and that the only people who get obsessive about them are people who are most likely never to do them, who are like the people who are so hyped, like the person who is worried that they're filthy and they wash their hands a thousand times a day. Uh, they're the least likely person to ever be filthy, but. Um, um, and then there's a difference between that and like uh, um, psychosis, where somebody might genuinely, or uh, what is, uh, yeah, when somebody's a uh, predator or something like that. I mean, there's a genuine difference between that, between that and I want to take that seriously too, uh, that there is that as a problem if you act out on those things. But that's the reason I think people don't talk about it because it's like you don't want people to misunderstand. Right. Because I've had that happen. I went to a therapist, went to a therapist and a psychiatrist who I told them I, and I just kind of said it in passing, just saying, I have a lot of thoughts and there was something and then they asked about it and I was like, I was trying to educate Paul because I just want to, I just want to help. And, (laughs) um, and both of them were horrified. Were just like, um, well, I might need to make a report about this. Like, um yeah one guy said that i was that i could be psychotic and i was just like and he was a yeah i mean it's like i can see why people it 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 people people feel alone because it's a harder thing to talk about because people can misunderstand what you mean by it um yeah it's not a delightful thought that you're <laughs> wanting to uh, right. it's enjoy. Not, right, and these are these aren't thoughts that you know. I, I'm going to hold that thought and go masturbate. Yeah, no, that's the last thing yeah, I no, want to no, do no, no, while no. I'm thinking yeah, this. Yeah, while yeah. I'm thinking this thought. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways. Okay. Um, so uh, you're 10, 12 years old. You've got the. You've got these. Uh, You've got an eating disorder. Yeah. Uh, you've you've got uh, unwanted thoughts uh, syndrome, and you've got suicidal ideation. Right. And you're I'm, a triple threat. I'm tr- I'm a triple threat, and also, but I got a great f- fam- family, and I got you know good g- good schools g- going to, and I'm playing. I'm learning to play the violin. I was an excellent violinist um, from the age of three to you know. And I think those things do help a lot. Like I got a lot of. I was in a gifted kids program where you could go and, you know, had a really a good neighborhood where it's like I could knock on my neighbor lady's house and go, what are you doing? <laughs> and I could, you know, and she would go, well, I'm just playing the piano. And then, you know, I could have some place to hang out, yeah. like, like a nice neighborhood where you could, um, there, there was a community. So I look back on that and I go, oh my God, that's, that's awesome uh, that I had that. Um, and, and yeah, and I think the, the one thing I think that most people are in, in the U.S. can relate with is that the uh, that that you can so easily be isolated. Like you put kids in front of a TV, and the kids love the TV, and you might not see them for six hour, you know, six hours. And um, yeah, I just and I, I know I I. I I wonder about that. Like, I one that's probably why I'm not a parent is because I probably would want to put them in front of a TV, but because children are exhausting. But uh, I think that's problematic too because then you don't know how to connect with people or comfort yourself through connection rather than or and having boundaries, but you know having healthy relationships rather than just a TV and and also games. I, I would imagine too that little twelve year old girl thinks that she's worse than everybody 
Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. So that is standing between you and bonding and feeling a part of because in your mind is always the thought that I'm the biggest piece of shit in the room. If they only knew, they would all turn and run out of here. When in reality, you're probably the most sensitive, funny, loving kid in the room. But the 12 year old, even the 22 year old, even the 35 year old yeah. doesn't know that. Right, right. Yeah, it's. Uh I did pretty well at stuff as a kid. You know, I was relatively... I mean, I had friends and everything, and I uh, was relatively social, but uh, I'm just grateful for all those little elements that I think helped a lot. Like, the, you know, the, the creativity helped a lot. Like, that's when... I remember I was in a gifted program. I got to do speeches. It was, like, kind of the first time. and was probably, you know, precursor to stand-up, which I, I really liked performing because it kind of blocked out anxiety and because I and then also it was a way to communicate people in mass in a very safe way where they you know couldn't say anything back I, I think I my feelings got hurt so easily like it was just sort of I was such a sensitive plant that it was yeah I was sort of dumb and um did you I, sometimes I wish you had videos of yourself when you're a kid so it's like you go Oh Jesus! Like I was a pain in the ass, <laughs> like because you know I think I probably was, um, but uh, you know, it can be super sweet too. I'm sure you are very sweet, yeah, sweet, sweet kid. Uh, you had also mentioned uh, I've listened to your uh, appearance on uh, the JV Club, uh, Janet Varney's oh, yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah. Loved it. You also mentioned that uh, mental illness runs in your in but, your family. Yes, yeah, and. I don't know. My mom's done a lot of genealogical stuff, so there's certain members of her side of the family who just like, and then she went in the attic and didn't come out for 25 years. Like, okay, that that sounds that sounds familiar. You know, like you know, like you know, back in the 1880s, where it's sure. like she just she didn't want to be around people, and um, all she wanted to do was churn butter. Yeah. <laughs> She, everyone said how sweet she was, though. She was very nice. When you saw her. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, my aunt has had uh, manic episodes on my mom's side. And my mom has had one one hypomanic episode. I think my mom, where she didn't uh, go totally full-blown. But just that sort of super agitated, um, calling the Pope, uh, which... Somebody should call him. She get through. Uh, she did get to. I mean, my mom is very charming. Uh, she did get to t uh, talk to a monsignor. Did she really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if he hung up uh, soon after, but um, and she called my manager a bunch of times. Uh, poor Bruce is telling her, how, telling him how I was in danger and I needed to get off the internet, and which you know, pretty true on some level. <laughs> uh, we're all in danger. And, and we uh, all need to get off the, the internet. internet. <laughs> these are these are wise. Wow. These aren't manic. Um, but and and that was and, and I get why people don't like mental, you know, because it is frightening. It is frightening to see somebody like when my mom went off the rails. I was just like, you and know, confusing. kind of made fun of it, and yeah, confusing. And it feels personal. It feels like. They're being mean. Like, my mom got kind of agitated mean. Like, was saying, you know, kind of like heckling my sister on Facebook. And, like, and which my sister then shut her out. But, uh, you know, saying, oh, come on, give me a break. You don't need, like, was just being this really oddly sassy, uh, you know, sort of version of herself. Um, but, yeah, cruel. Cr not very nice. And, um and yeah, so that it was disturbing, you know, and I wanted and she didn't she also didn't want to get help, you know, because I think that's part of the mania is you're like, I'm fine. And part of it probably feels good yeah, because no, you're feeling great. vigorous and, and energized in control and very mentally focused. Right, right. Totally, totally focused. And and um, and it's so funny. My mom, she used to work in the psych ward that she went into in Duluth, which really I mean, that is so brutal slash courageous like to live in a smaller town and have to go into a unit where you'll know people she knew everybody and um 
you know, how humbling that is. And, um, yeah, so, and that's what I, I felt that way. I, I went to a Glendale and Venice Medical Center a couple a couple times and then once to Las Encinas in, in Pasadena. And, you know, it is you should like... write a travel book about them. Well, that's... I did want to do that. Like, some sort Seriously? of Zagats, too. Because there's no... I mean, I got... Some, well... I was a little bit out of my gourd, but I, I went to Las Encinas, and it was all false advertising. Like, they said there was going to be a swimming pool and yoga, which, who knows if I could have done, but none of it. Like, it wasn't at all there. It, there's nothing... It, they, um, they just hadn't updated their website for four years or something, <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's the thing that's interesting about mental health. It seems like... People are ashamed to be there, so they're less likely to likely to complain on some level. Like, because you look crazy anyways sure. for complaining. So, no, oh, she's going on and on about there should have been a pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, it, and it is a hospital, and you are just there so that you're safe. Um, but it was like, oh, I, oh, I guess you know, like I was a dumb because I I tried to find some place that. Uh, was aesthetically pleasant, you know, that because that helps your mental health. If there's trees, and I'd I'd been to Las Encinas uh, just in passing before. Cause sometimes they have support groups out there, and um, and yeah, so I went, I went out there, and it was um, yeah, it was not just, good. Well, it, it was good in that it was uh, it was safe, and and it, but. There's just there's you know there's just funny psychiatrist story like this, the psychiatrist who, okay so he's got an iPad an iPhone and like another bag of tricks, and he sits down and he's like kind of lays out his entire body he's probably like six foot three, puts his feet up on the table and he's like so and kind of like squidges down in his chair kind of like a basketball star and I'm like what. What's going on? I mean, not that... I mean, I get it. You're here all day. You know, maybe you see everything. You're tired. But then... And he, then he started taking phone calls during the session, which is... Um, I had to pay p- cash out of pocket. He was the only psychiatrist I could see. So it's 350 bucks, And he was taking calls. And I said, hey, man... You know, could you just not take a couple calls as well? I'm, you know, I'm very busy. I go, yeah, you know. So I tried to say something about it, and then um, we got into, you know, like, what, yeah, what he was just asking me about my story. Um, I think he was listening because he did say, <laughs> I, I, when I said I was a comedian, and um, all of a sudden I hear from his iPad come up the sound of like a voice or something like that. I was like, oh, is he playing a video game now? Like, what's going on? He had YouTubed me during the session and was like playing it back to me like um, target spots. And I was like, hey, are, are hey, you hey, sh- hey, buddy. Hey, what, what? And and I, I said, um, you know, this is insane. And I think I was fairly pleasant about it, and he he said, uh, "Oh well, I just had to make sure that you weren't uh, psychotic." And I'm like, "You know, if somebody's psychotic, you check that shit later out. You know, like Hi. like at least say you're Jesus. You know, <laughs> I think I'll you know what I'll put that in internet search engine a little bit later and just see what comes up. You don't look like the Jesus I know, but I, I, wow. I'm going to just take you for your word. Like he was saying that he." you know, had to know that I was really an entertainer. I'm like, how many people say that they're entertainers in Los Angeles County, even if I'm not? Who gives a shit? Like, what does that have to do with anything? So that, I think, it, the humbling part of it of going, uh, yeah, like, what you were saying, when you go in the hospital, it's like you just got to let go and go, okay, I'm, I'm here and just... um let let go just hope for the best because um i'm you know it, it was good for me to be there because i i felt um safe you know and the, i was you know so the, i just want to interject something for for anybody I, i'm so glad that you that you talked about that because a lot of people will have an experience like that and then say that stands 
for all psychiatry and they will never go back. Oh my and God. Yeah. No, no, no. There no. are bad ones out there, but there, the majority of help out there is good. And if you just keep going, just keep looking, you will find the right one and you will know because you, when you walk into that room, or after a couple of visits, you will feel safe, you will feel listened to, and you will feel like, okay, I'm moving forward with this person. Now. Yeah, and and this guy could have just been having a bad day. He's no, probably, he's a fucking yeah, asshole. He's, well, <laughs> burned out or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Everybody has, I mean, I know, um, obviously, I've had some bad days at work where I have not shown up. <laughs> and um, so... Uh, I I get that, but but uh, but yeah, I've also had some wonderful ones. Um, the one in the, uh, I mean, have you ever read um the medical reporter for he he writes um he's a physician Atul Gawande is it he's mm-hmm. a sometimes he'll write um I don't read art. foreigners okay <laughs> um he's an American and we're all immigrants um. He, uh, just about the American healthcare system, and like, I, I just, uh, just the idea that listening is so important part part of medical, like any medical transaction is like, it just that it's healing to be heard, you know, and so uh, healing, yeah, yeah, to just and and to be like the guy the. This guy who was um, the psychiatrist in the, in the ever at Glendale Adventist, he said, tell me your story from the beginning, which I was like, what? Like, in a very calm, like, genuinely interested way. And I was like, oh, my God, dude, you're good. <laughs> like, that's that's very generous. Like, that's very generous. And, um, and, and it just seemed, yeah, just like a very... Um, uh, of course, it meant I wanted to keep it tight. I tried to keep it tight because uh, I don't want to. I don't want to, you know, uh, go go over the light. But um, he, he did have a light, and then I did try to wrap it up after the five minute mark. But yeah, did uh, he lose interest when the checks went out? <laughs> yeah, he totally lost. But that's because he was distracted. Yeah. It wasn't that he wasn't enjoying the show? Um, Stand up jargon yeah. that Marie and I are exchanging. <laughs> But, but, and I have a current psychiatrist who she's not perfect. You know, we've had some, like, I got totally irritated when she put me on, or she didn't put me on. I chose, uh, accepted the prescription of, uh, Lamictal, which is, uh, I think is very successful with people who, um, uh, mood stabilizer. And, um, one of the main side effects, though, is cognitive problems where you have trouble speaking, talking, or thinking. And I think if you're, you know, and 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 I felt so mad that she did not tell me that, you know, that 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 was one of the main side effects that one would find. I was like, dude, I'm a, you know, like I'm a comedian, like that's all, that's my job, and and. And so I was able to tell her that, and she was like, yeah, yeah, I just haven't had... She hadn't had anybody who'd had that kind of job before. So, um... So and, you got off that one. Yeah, I got off that one. I mean, that's, I think, good, too, to be able to share... Uh, you know, I'm sure she, you know, she's been irritated with me, because one thing I do... I don't know if you do this, Paul... But I like to forget to refill my prescriptions. <laughs> oh, my God! What?! I'll be fine just for a couple days off. What am I doing? Don't touch the hot stove, as my sister says. The stove's hot. Don't touch it. What if I just go off my meds for a couple? No. Hey, stove, hot. Don't touch it. (laughs) So that's, I cannot imagine how irritating that is to physicians. It's like, you know, because I've, I've called her from various cities and said, Oh, I forgot. Can you call in a prescription? That's <laughs> a thing, you know, and and that there. I'm sure there is a huge high burnout rate because it's just super. Str- I have friends who work in mental health, and just to have people, and especially people like myself, white, privileged. You know, I've got everything, and then you know to hear that person being in crisis it's like oh come on you know when there's plenty of people um i have a friend who works uh worked in mental health in um south central compton mental health center and people are sleeping overnight in the alley to make their 
meds appointments. Wow. Because you have to take three buses to get there or, um, I mean, like it's, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just. And uh, and you also think about the fact that that is a depressed person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> who struggles to get up, who str- is struggling to do the most mundane of tasks. Yeah, yeah. So imagine how many people aren't willing to jump over those hurdles yeah. and are just going to sit in their sickness and yeah. take what comes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, or why not just drink all day? Because, I mean, the you got to wait at the mental health clinic uh, while you're feeling horrible for four hours for your appointment. Uh, maybe they're there. Maybe the appointment got screwed up and you've got to come back tomorrow on two to three buses. Uh, maybe they'll have your meds, you know, and um, yet it's not, it, it just, it and a just, lot of the people you probably encounter at that place are burned out. Super and so burned out. you get the feeling, the nonverbal cues that they don't really care about me. Right. They don't care. Yeah. And my, my friend had 200 clients, 200, one person, 200 clients. And, and, you know, many of those clients are people with severe mental, you know, like, um, schizophrenia and, and, um, who had a number of things going on, like, drug and alcohol abuse like just so many things yeah i feel like some people have it really terribly and i guess that that was the good thing in hearing from my of people especially in the the hospital i found that um some of the people who who were lifelong you know schizophrenia where you know sometimes you're in and out of the hospital and halfway house and and or on the street or it feels better to be out on the street and off your meds and it feels to be on the meds because the meds make you feel fat and sleepy and terrible all the time you know like um um like those people just seem to be very zen on some level you know like i <laughs> i have a, an, a joke just saying that um you know, sometimes you got to wrap a blanket burrito around your meats and cheeses, put a little feed bag of microwave popcorn around your neck, and take have the Coast Guard take you to Lost at Sea Hospital because you are lost at sea. And there you'll walk around a cement courtyard with a schizophrenic man with no teeth and no pants who keeps saying things like, It gets better. I don't know if I believe you, but you're very sweet. Um, but that's like was that your so experience? sweet, yeah, like really lovely, sweet man. Like I was just yeah pacing the halls like everybody, and um, he would always come by and go, "You're gonna be okay," and you know, and <laughs> you know, he'd obviously been through this a bil- you know billion times, you know, being hospitalized, and it was yeah, it's just very. Very sweet. Very. Uh... Can we talk about the hospitalization from the beginning of before where you were and how it progressed to the point where you knew you wanted to hospitalize yourself? Well, this was about a year and a half ago. Well, yeah, like a year. I remember and a half. getting an email from you saying that you were going che- in, checking your checking, checking yourself in. in. Yeah, yeah. Oh. um... Didn't get a response from that. Uh, no, <laughs> I did. I did email. No, yeah, that. I know yeah. you did. You did. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, what happened? I was. I mean, probably ever since I turned forty, I started. And I don't know if this is a biochemical thing or I also situational thing. I moved to a house, so I was more isolated. There's also a bit more stress and pressure. I had a relationship breakup. A bunch of things going on, so it's like maybe those things added to it and i told my and my mom had a manic episode and i told my friends hey if i ever start talking too fast or having a lot of great ideas just let me know you know just you know and i'll go go into the huskal and um can i stop you for one yes. second uh you have a bipolar bipolar 2 i guess is the new gladiator sandal and uh <laughs> So that's that's what it's called now. Okay. But um, yeah, because I always thought I was just depressed, uh, which I I felt <laughs> that was true. But I I did have times of like agitated and wanting getting a bunch of stuff done. I do remember staying up all night, being able to stay up all night doing things, mm-hmm. and I guess that's like a light mania. And I didn't I didn't realize that because um, I'd heard about my 
I'd heard about bipolar one, which is you can really tell, you know, somebody's spending thousands of dollars and, and then, and then alternately really cutting themselves or, you know, you know, severe ups and downs. And I didn't, um, I didn't know that I have that. So, uh, so my friend said, Hey, Maria, uh, you know how you told me just seems like you're kind of talking kind of fast. (laughs) And so I was like, okay. And my, Psychiatrist said also that I past you know couple months have been saying you're really you're speedy you're like really speedy I want you to try this mood stabilizer and I was like no I don't need that that's for (laughs) crazy people Um, and so I was you know refused and then so then I thought okay I'll I'll go on this mood stabilizer and I was and I just wanted to do the responsible thing. Uh, and I was feeling bad, so I thought I'll just I'll go into. I went to Las Encinas and um, had and it was you know got ready for a nice swim. Right, ready for a nice swim. <laughs> Have, it's going to be a relaxing weekend, and so it wasn't super high pressure. Like I was just like, oh, I'm going to nip this in the bud and just not be by myself. While I'm going on this new medication. I'm not feeling the greatest. Um, so I did that and. Um, and it was helpful. And I think that's when I got on Limbic Doll. And I was like, okay, well, I better have this because I've spent three days in the hospital. So back out on the road. And, uh, you know, then uh, with Limbic Doll, it wasn't, wasn't working. And then also starting to have real problems with work, working. And, um, yeah, that Be- just... Because it was difficult to form sentences, sentences and thoughts. Yeah, and I started to get more and more terrified and more and more sort of jacked up depressed it's like suicidal hopeless like and uh so the second time oh and i i went through an outpatient treatment program at the glendale adventist um for about six weeks after that and you know basically kind of like breeze not breeze through it but just was like okay (laughs) i got this okay okay bye (laughs) and um and it, it Basically, outpatient was just to create some sort of structure, I think, and that was very helpful. It wasn't; it was cognitive behavioral therapy, and um, it wasn't like, "Oh, I'm learning a ton." It was providing a comfort and a place to go where I could kind of stabilize while getting on these new meds. So, so you were off Lamictal at that point? No, no, no. I was still on it, and okay. then, but then and starting to go on the road and um, starting to go back to work, and then just things kept getting worse. Like I was uh, doing the road, and like I have to call my psychiatrist. Just freaked out, Leo, because I wasn't able to sleep, and uh, and yeah, it just things started to get more and more kind of confusing and sort of frightening and it wasn't getting better and um that must be terrifying yeah 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 because i mean i always feel like especially uh, uh, the american way is like well you take the correct actions you know i mean and i don't know maybe this is a i come from a family where it's like people are always suggesting things well you know what i did you know (laughs) um you know my mom was like you know what i did that's probably exactly what i did because you raised me (laughs) we do the exact same things we do almost the exact same things. Uh, you know, did you, well, honey, did you call around and see if that plumber hit? Yes, I did. I did do that, Mom. Like, it, it just like wanting to think, oh, if I take the right actions, then everything's going to be fine. And it just wasn't that way at all. It was just like this long, embarrassing process. I had a mentee, mentee, somebody who, yeah. I, who I, you know, so you, somebody you friend. were mentoring yeah, in a support mentoring. group. And she, uh, yeah, she she called uh, she called me and I called her from the psych ward just to tell her I was in the psych ward and she was like, you know what? Um, it just sounds like you're really busy. You know, maybe it's not that I'm like, oh, oh no, you know what? You don't think I have what you want? Um, anyways, but so the things started to just get worse and worse, and I but I didn't want it to become worse and worse, and I was kind of feeling like it was my fault, like. The medications weren't kicking in and and they were kind of confusing me like I just couldn't uh, get a handle on my thoughts and uh, then so I think it was um, six months late I don't know I'm not sure the timeline because it's it's it okay. feels like it's been 
six, four, five or six months later, I'd gone through the outpatient treatment program, gotten a certificate signed by all the therapists, which does feel good. And um, my sister had come to visit, and I just... And I thought that that was going to help. Like, I thought, oh, it'll be fun, you know. And I just started to kind of freak out. So I checked myself in at uh, Glendale Adventist, and which is is definitely more of a, a very hospital-like set, setting. It's very closed in. There isn't, um, there's like a cement courtyard place to, you can hoof it around in your in your socks and uh, they give you socks. You get some nice socks with Because they take your shoes, right? They take your shoes and your shoelaces. You can wear your shoes as long as they're without shoelaces. Then that feels a little cuckoo. <laughs> right. <laughs> and yeah, and you, you go to different groups all day that are, uh, you know, whoa. You know, it's uh, humbling, you know, like grooming group where you have to ask the nurse if, can I please have a you know, razor to shave my light mustache that has grown over the, you know, and then they watch you while you're doing it. And wow, you know, it's yeah. uh, not, it's not fun. You know, it's not super fun. But but, but the, I think the important thing is I was safe because I had started planning, like going, well, I have all these pills. I'll just, you know, and, and it was such a disappointment to my sister and my family just feeling like, oh, I, I, you know, invited her out here. Anyways, I was just feeling worse and worse and just having terrible ideas. And uh, then, and this might have been, they, it, it, my uh, psychiatrist suggested they they do brain scans where they can tell the, now tell you what medications might work best for you, but you have to get off all your meds first. Mm. Oh boy. And, and the funny thing is, my mom does really well on Depakote, and she has for like 30 years. I didn't want to take Depakote because um, I worried about weight gain. So, all that to say, uh, I refused to take Depakote, which probably would have worked right away, because what I'm on now. And You're on uh, Depakote now. Uh, Depakote now, and yeah. Yeah, I feel really great, or yeah, really great. Um, I'm still a little bit more sleepy than usual, but... I went off of everything and they did. I mean, that was just, and that's when I went to the hospital for about seven days because it was just. Was that when you sent the email? I think, I don't know. I can't remember yeah. when I sent the email. There's several cries for help. I'm so sorry. I hope yeah. I didn't. No, I didn't. In, in the th- I feel bad because I didn't know it was cry for help. I thought no, it was no, your, no. I thought it was your way of saying, uh, I'm going off by myself now. I'll, please don't contact me. Oh, okay. That's, oh, that's so funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If I had known that you were that you wanted visitors, because no, I heard no. you say on Janet's podcast that you wanted people to visit you, and I felt terrible because no, I was no. like, oh, I would have visited no, no, you no, in no, a heartbeat. No, I know, and I think I, I, I part of me, I just, I think it was low self esteem of going, oh, I don't want, and also not wanting anybody to see me like that. It felt like you were pushing, yeah, ev- everybody, everybody away. away. Just the way it was worded yeah, and everything yeah. was. No, I think I think you're right because then I, I think you had said something about I'll I'll contact you. you when, when I I'm get get it out, out. Yeah. yeah, and now I look back and I go, I mean, were something like that to happen again, I'd be like, oh my god, get everybody, you know, anybody want to come visit? Come visit because it is, it was, you know, it's it's uh, number one, it's hilarious. It is kind of fun. it's a very fun memory in retrospect that I share with some friends of them coming to visit. <laughs> Just uh, how uh, ridiculous it was, and. Um, but yeah, so then I went in for about se- seven days, and um, and that was just and it was awful. You know, I just felt awful, so awful. Did, can you describe what you were feeling? Um, I just I, there's not really it's it's not anything I'd felt before. Uh, sort of this whole gradual slide. It was it was like that darkness visible book, like just like yeah, it's it's like breathing is is not good like i just want to be knocked out like every day was just uh like a minute by second by second sort of torture it wasn't i mean i've been depressed before and uh you know crying and stuff like that and this was not crying like this was just like 
I am in this high state of agitation, just like sort of like I couldn't read, I couldn't, I couldn't write, I couldn't uh, focus on anything. Um, I couldn't really talk to people very well. Um, yeah, it was um, very odd, very odd and and disturbing. And it's, I, it sounds exhausting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, it was, um, and there was no. <laughs> that's the thing. They don't have any exercise. I mean, some of the things that are so helpful for mental health, they don't have. Like, there's a lot of carbs in mental health facilities, and a lot of. Uh, and I think I think there may be some lack of funding issue or or burnout. You know, like some things. I thought like they'd have groups, and and there's some wonderful people, like really wonderful, who did things where people would kind of connect people and. Like one lady was so great. She came in and she was uh, Filipino, and she was like, "Let's do a you know a game or something." And it was hilarious. Like it was, I mean, and it was kind of really did occupy your brain a little bit, and everybody could participate. But then, like, <laughs> I remember this one guy do a group every day, and the whole group would be like, "Let's go around the room. How's everybody feeling?" And people are feeling. Horrible. I mean, their, their answers aren't going to change from day to day. Like, it's like, you know, sometimes life, you know, it's just suffering, you know? You just you just feel, you know, it's it's not good, you know? And you think, is it going to get better? And it doesn't. Anyways, how you doing, Alice? How you doing? <laughs> well, there's a television in my head, and sometimes I hear it. I'm trying to turn it off. Well, how are you feeling, though, Alice? Well, uh, I'm worried that the uh, R- Russian militia is coming over the hill. I, I know that, uh, but uh, Alice, how you feeling? I'm pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> like, it's, it's so <laughs> totally useless on some level. You know, I was like, you know what would be more useful if we, we, we played a game like One Big Blob. Have you ever played One Big Blob? No. It's a tag game where one person has to chase somebody else and then they start chanting One Big Blob and then the people chase somebody else and then they all start linking hands and pretty soon there's like, you know, 20 people, One Big Blob, chasing one person and then you become One Big Blob. Anyways, like easy, easy things are having like a, 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 a just a, or like a joke book like even if people could read aloud from it like some of the m- moments of relief were like i'd ask people you know hey do you have any jokes and um and they tell and i'd be like okay you know it was like sort of a relief for a second because i couldn't read read anything and just to get your mind off off uh yeah just uh how it wasn't so good would you try to make other people laugh and break the ice oh no i yeah was beyond well beyond that <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I was, sentences were too hard yeah yeah it was not not good so, not good so what was the 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 turn any other highlights or low highlights, lights from that um um i did see another comedian there though oh yeah yes yeah, hilarious i and i could not i um they were having some sort of uh, issue i think it, and i think it was addiction related um and but anyways, it was so funny. They were making phone calls off the phone to get gigs the next weekend <laughs> from the psych ward. And I'm like, wow. oh, my God, that is awesome. Wow. <laughs> wow. It was so great. Um, which I, you know, had I been, I mean, that's basically what I was trying to do yeah. before. Just like, and then, oh, and then I went through the the outpatient treatment program again a second time at Glendale Adventist and and that really helped me just get more into acceptance like what you're saying of letting go like okay this is this is it this isn't I'm not gonna make it go away and and um just you know let it let it ride like I can't uh can't uh fix it and and it seemed like everybody who I talked to who had got, you know, I, I did talk to Jonathan Winters on the phone. Yeah? Yeah. And he, I mean, it sounds like um, he's had to go into the hospital a number of times. And back in the 60s, you had to go in for months. Like, they would just keep you down with Valium. And then maybe you came out of whatever episode you're in. Um, but he was very kind you know he said hey you got a good shrink and i said uh, yes i do and he said uh, 
Well, then you just keep going, which I, that's it. That's it. You just keep going. And, and, and they did have friends who had been through terrible things who said it will get better. Um, and, and I did not believe them at all. I did not. Which is so odd to me because I've had a very good life. So it is weird how quickly I completely obliterated that that's from a, that, my brain. That's how convincing mental illness is. It's so fucking convincing. I always say, it, you know, George Lucas has nothing on, yeah. <laughs> on mental illness. It is creates a world that is not real that is so fucking believable and you yeah. really believe that it is never going to get better because the way you feel feels like it's going to last forever right right yeah it all and it everything points towards it making sense and it just yeah you're just it's just not yeah it's it's almost yeah it's like it's working against you your brain is working against you and um but but and the great thing is now i mean just like it, the wonderful thing is how much i appreciate like i've just you know I appreciate life. I'm like, oh, oh, thanks. Oh my god! You know, like I, I can perform and I can think of things. Like I just, I had this great weekend in Toronto recently where I was able. I was, wrote a bunch of new jokes and, um, and it was just so, so delightful. Like how grateful I am for that. Uh, that that is. Uh, that's a possibility that it, yeah it's just it, i mean it's just like what everybody says you know when they go through something and then they come out and they're like i'm just so i just have a lot of gratitude but it sounds it sounds cheesy and corny but, but it's true. true it's totally yeah yeah and i believe that life is you're either appreciating something or you're in the process of building your appreciation yeah, yeah, for yeah, something yeah. that's how I try, I try to look at it yeah and, yeah uh, because a, I've I've lived for 40 years with a pessimistic negative attitude and it only buried me deeper right. into into shame and self-pity and and closer to suicide. Right, right, right. Well, and that's I mean, I think there's something to yeah, there's something about uh getting older too, I think has been like a psychological change of going, okay, especially in our society like I may not, I, number one, I may not be at the top of my game anymore. You know, maybe I'm not the best, and I, I mean, not that I ever was the best, but maybe I'm just okay at my job. Maybe I'm just okay at my relationships, and there isn't some, like, I'm not, I'm not, um, like, it's, it, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to... Uh, wait for some magical time and then I'm still okay like a that um like I did shot the special and I, you know part of me is like oh is it any good and it's like so what like <laughs> who cares like it just it just doesn't matter um and I mean but if you'd like to buy it for four ninety nine, dollars that is my sales pitch so what? Um, uh, but you know when people ask you, oh, how, how did you do comedy? Which because I used to ask that of comedians, mm -hmm. like how did you make it? And it's like I remember Emo Phillips just said, "Pretty soon you done it for a long time, and a lot of people have seen you." <laughs> okay, and that's exactly what I you know I say that to comedians. I say, "Oh yeah, you just do it, and then you keep doing it, and then pretty soon you've been doing it for a long time." People say, "Oh, you still doing that?" And uh, <laughs> Like, it's no, there's no mystery. And I realized that's what people have been trying to tell me about relationships. Like, I've thought there's this, this, this magical thing. And it's like, no, it's hard. There's going to be those two weeks in Laughlin where <laughs> you're questioning what you do. And there's blood on the wall. And you have to, <laughs> the only joy you get is a toaster pastry from the hallway. But... You know, and but you hang in there, you know? People say, oh, well, I mean, you have to go on all these dates, which are not unlike uh, open mics. You have to go on open mics. You, you just sit there for six hours, and, and sometimes you don't get up. Yeah, that's it. That's the whole thing. Like, you know, like, uh, why have I been having such a high standard <laughs> for relationships yeah. that they'll... I mean, of, of course, there's going to be moments of joy, you know, when you... When you um. You get that good gig at Flappers in Claremont, 
um, and you know you you sell some merch, um, and then hopefully it's just inertia that keeps you in, and uh, you're on that cruise when you've been married fifty years, and people are like, "How'd you guys do it?" and uh, and that's uh, that's what I feel like when I'm a do- doing a show right now. Happy for anniversary, show business. I still love you. Is, is, it, is it fair to say that sometimes you just need to stop worrying and anticipating when is the, the great moment going to come? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And j- just try to enjoy the moment that you're in? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like all these things that, that have been said through the, the end of time, you know, the ages. But, but that, that they said that because they are, they are helpful. Um, and true, but but I have to say that when I was feeling bad, nothing helped me. Like, yeah, like uh, any sort of spirituality, meditation, um, uh, twelve steps. Like, I was when it comes out. to a chemical imbalance in the brain, there there is sometimes nothing but medicine. Yeah, I was just, yeah, I was just out. So. And and it was comforting. To, I mean, fr- friends did come to visit me, or I talked to them on the phone. But it it was, and that was great. Um, but it wasn't any sort of, y- yeah. It was just bad. Yeah. Which I've heard that about, like what a cancer, or whatever. It's like, oh no, it was horrible, and uh, they removed, you know, certain part, like a surgery. You know, it's just it's horrible sometimes, and then you just keep going through it. You just keep going through it. Yeah. 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 Okay. You know when you love someone so much, Paul, um, but you can't, you know it's not enough. I painted this dog bank for my dad at Color Me Mine. It's right in front of me right now. Um, it's a ceramic dog. Ceramic dog, which is also a bank because I want him to have his own money. Where's the money going? Money's oh. going into the head. Oh, you didn't choose the butthole. Oh, well, they didn't, there wasn't a choice there at Color Me mm. Mine. But oh, there I see. A, you didn't make it. You just oh, painted no, it. Oh, no. I just painted it. It's a lazy okay. man's craft store. Okay. You just pick it out, and then they slab it with... And I, I worked very hard on the collar, but then I started to lose interest, and I just dabbed paint all over it, and I felt like, is that all I can do for my father? I love him so much. You know, it's like we... I don't know. I was just thinking about that, you know, that I can't love people enough like i'm always gonna let somebody down you know i'm gonna give somebody a shoulder-based hug i'm gonna forget their birthday i'm gonna half-ass it on the last part of the paint job on their ceramic dog how can i you know just let people know how i really feel so i have a bonfire on my front lawn and it's going 24 7 and i just tend to that And there's a live webcam and that way if anyone questions you know if i forget something or if i'm uh, you know, uh, grumpy. Click on that link, and you know how I feel about you, Eternal Flame. <laughs> Anyways, that's a new joke premise. That's a new joke premise. But I am going to send this to my dad. I think it's beautiful. Well, it's very unattractive, and I think that's also going to be great for my dad because he likes to irritate with my mom mm-hmm. and have things that are kind of unattractive out. <laughs> And I just, I can't wait to hear, her, you know, her saying, well, why don't we put this downstairs? You know, I think this would be great behind the TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a ceramic dog bank uh, with the tags reading JoJo. My dad's name is Joel. And uh, anyways, it's going home for Christmas. Don't tell him. Don't tell him what's I coming. I won't. I yeah. won't. Well, Maria Bamford, thank you so much. Um I got a lot out of this. Yes, okay. And <laughs> seriously. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. good. Oh, good. I mean, oh. I love talking to you. It's oh. um, you're a kindred spirit, and oh, yeah. uh, I love what you do on and off stage. And oh, just wanna, thanks, Paul. I want to thank you. I love. I want. I love. I love talking about mental illness. I never get enough.